minimize the loudness of the mic. Keep it down here is something more normal level of voice. Sorry? If everyone comes closer, we might even not need the mic, which would be great. Okay, so... I think it's fine because it's like more guerrilla style mic. <laughs> guerrilla style. So yeah, I think uh, this is... Each of these sessions uh, of 30 minutes or a little longer is meant to just give some space to begin to introduce some, uh, in a different way the work of the artists that are taking part in this big exhibition. And uh, it's a pleasure to try to do this together with Paul being here. And um, it's also a chance possibly if you have questions to give space to them. So we will try to just begin because it's always good to have a ground. But then if you have questions, then it's nice to break this monologue with, with one another and maybe open up to you. But as a beginning, my own experience is it's always good to give something as a start. So, um, and I'm going to assume that many of you are not already familiar with Paul's work and research. And so, uh, if some of you are and are here to hear more profound things, I guess your question will come afterwards, not that the introduction won't be profound, it's just we try to at least introduce where the ideas are coming from, the work is coming from, because for Irene and I that's always really important, because sometimes things can be formal and you see a form, but you, you don't have a sense of what kind of life produced that and what the motivations or interests were. So I think that maybe as a beginning, it's good with you, Paul, just to um, try to describe to us the, how, how, how you arrived at this idea of dream. Well, thank you for coming. Um, I hope I can make a little sense out of this for you and, and you find it of interest. Uh, the question Renee is asking is, um, how did I come to this notion of freeing, or, or what, what drove me over the hill into triads, or something like that? Um, I was part of a group of people in the late 60s, early 70s, involved with videotape. The group was called a, a Rain Dance. We published a magazine called Radical Software. This is 1968, 69, 70. And at that point, uh, some of you may be familiar with the work of Marshall McLuhan. He was very prominent then. I was working with him. I was working with a small group, as I said, Rain Dance. And in all of these experiences, including experiences going back to my own family, uh, I had found that often what, what would happen is in small group behavior, it would get jammed up very quickly. Uh, you might be able to you know, meet people and work with them wonderfully for a year, but then things would start to tighten up. So I got it in my head that perhaps with video, we could learn to invent collaborative behavior that we had not figured out before. So this tape over here, what you're seeing is from 71 to 76, and it's early efforts to invent triadic behavior. The issue I went after was this, that normally when you get three people together, two combine to push one out, all right? That's the general dynamic. By a lot of videotape, over 45 hours of videotape over a five-year period, uh, and working with a number of people and a number of ideas, I was able to, as it were, invent a yoga of relationships uh, that is, uh, is called freeing. And this uh, pavilion here is, is um, designed to give you a taste of what that practice might be like and, uh, and invite your interest. Maybe you can uh, say what is freeing further, yoga of relationships? But how would we further define it for us? Okay. What's involved is that there are three people and they are taking turns playing three different roles. Right? The roles are initiator, respondent, and mediator. 
These roles correspond to the categories of the American philosophers some of you may know. Uh, name of Charles Peirce. He died in 1914. So he was after a triadic logic. Uh, he worked very hard to develop this logic, and it was passed on to people in cybernetic circles. And uh, there was an effort, as I say, to get three, three fundamental categories and work with them and see if they could work with interpersonal relationships. So what is freeing? Freeing is a practice. In other words, you repeat it. You can repeat it with different people. And if you work with it, it enables you to stabilize three-person behavior without the two-against-one dynamics. Right? And there are a lot of new dynamics in, in interpersonal relationships that arise with the practice of freeing that I think open up all kinds of uh, possibilities that we haven't yet seen. Is that what you're thinking? I'm wondering if we can, uh, if you have the technique. I wanted to say if we can do an example of seeing somehow, in some way. We have some of the students who are working. We could try, I mean, it's a, yeah, we could try something. I think we could begin by trying to, one person would say something, the second, you know, like, begin. And then we do secondness and thirdness. Mm -hmm. So you, maybe you begin. You're always good at spontaneity. <laughs> <laughs> I'll, I'll, I'll do second this, and Paul, you, you can be third. I think life under capitalism is uh, unbearable. <laughs> <laughs> but you have to try to explain to people what what is unbearable and what capitalism is for you. Yes, I think uh, most people respond to you as not wanting to see you go towards something unbearable. So it needs to be explained, and it needs to be explained in terms of the burden it puts upon on you and us. So we're, we're, we're taking roles, no? Do we have a talking stick handy? One of the ways we've, we've uh, semi-formalized this is as a device using this three-color stick, okay? So uh, Irene was in, in firstness, which is yellow, you know, it's like the sun waking up, red is like rage reacting, and blue is like the sky trying to build a bridge between the two of them. So we just went around a simple changing roles, okay? And we could go after that topic for quite a long time and perhaps come out of it with something strong. We could change with other people, you know, take turns with other people doing the same thing. Once the roles are clear, it's, enor it's enormously satisfying what can be done in terms of this way of relating to each other. You can operate non-verbally, you can operate verbally, you can operate with finger paints, you can operate drawing, a lot of art practices. Uh, a lot of stuff that is not accessible becomes accessible once you have a formal uh, way of approaching it. So I'll give you back this stick. Mm -hmm. Because we always tend to be, uh, we always tend to uh, play one of these uh, three roles, whether starting or mediating, uh, or responding or mediating. So it's a kind of a freeing experience to be uh, aware of, of, that, of those roles that um, we have or we are uh, constantly falling into and trying to change the pattern and then new things arise from this in-between uh, role. So you sh if you always initiate, then you should be... <laughs> That's what he said. <laughs> no, I mean, in a way, we already practiced it somehow at the beginning, but it's just this was explicit and the earlier version was not. Yeah. Because I entered and I immediately take the mic and I comfortably speak and I pose something and Paul is in place in the position of responding to that and then Irene tries to mediate the two and create you know, also be perceptive to the situation and, and I think that this is the point that actually in relations more than two, it's, it's the case that we're in, we're put in a relationship already of three, 
but those roles are not defined, and thus, if we habitually keep recurring the same role, there's a kind of a stagnation. stagnation. The flow is not there. That's why Paul is using this language of yoga, I think. Um, uh, there's a story I'd like to tell you about, just relates exactly to what we're talking about. I once invited a friend of mine who was an actor to invite two of her friends to practice dream. This was for a video production that I was involved in. And she went and you know picked picked another uh, person to work with. The two of them then picked a third person. Well, unbeknownst to themselves, we found out after three weeks that each of them had picked a potential sibling. That is to say that the first uh, person I asked was the oldest female of three females. The second they they she in turn asked somebody who was the second oldest female of three females. Mm. And the two of them asked, the third one they asked was the youngest of three females, siblings. So once they understood that this was a pattern, and that they in fact behaved in terms of this pattern and no other, because they were fixed into these oldest, middle, youngest person, it enormously, it, it allowed them enormous freedom, because they had at their uh, beck and call a lot of the tools that actors have in terms of emotional response and fullness of emotion. But for example, the woman who was the oldest of three siblings began to understand that she could trust the youngest one to take care of her at times. So she could go into firstness, be such as she was regardless of any, you know, without that nagging responsibility, I'm the oldest here, whatever happens, I've got to take responsibility for it. She slowly freed herself from that, took on more of the youngest child's uh, behavior, which has more freedom and spontaneity to it. And the same was true of the others, all right? So what, I, what we're saying to you is that in some ways this practice can undo the fixed, relate, fixed behavioral patterns that we often fall into for a whole set of reasons. Yeah. So maybe we see the question? Did yeah, you say sure. questions? No? Are there questions that people have? Because yeah, we could talk forever. But. One thing I'd like to know is... Uh, Maybe for the mic for the people who are yeah. in the back, sorry. Um, would you appreciate uh, your set of practices to be um, in every town around the world and in several places and like uh, people you educated spreading this? Uh, or is this just something for... Uh, well, restricted uh, group of people to be done? You know what I mean? Like, is this... Exclusive, or is this like um, like any actual kreis or whatever? You know what I mean? Uh, something for a big audience. Feldenkreis, you mean? Feldenkreis. Feldenkreis. Yeah. Or, or whatever, right? Yoga, yoga. Or, uh, anything. Yeah. Um, it's a wonderful question, a little embarrassing for me, all right? In the sense that I do believe if it were widely used, it would make an enormous difference in terms of conflict resolution. I think it could make an enormous difference in terms of education. I think I've, I've used this with worker and workers and worker training and, and taught people. I had a situation where I designed a workshop for people who were unemployed and having a very difficult time getting reemployed. We did a workshop for 60 people. 50 out of 60 found jobs within a month, right? After working intensely in this pattern. So in my mind, And again, you got to keep a jaded eye on me. I'm the guy who figured this out, right? So, of course, I think it's, it's the best thing since sliced bread, you know? Well, it is the best thing since sliced bread. <laughs> And it, it does work, you know? It really does work. So I, I would love to see it tried responsibly in many different venues and areas. You know, there are, we got a letter from some teachers in uh, Cologne who are using this in high school who I never met, who I never was in touch with, but they're already halfway down the road. Their letter is like fully informed with what's going on, and they want to figure out how they can deepen it. I'm delighted, you know. I think it's potentially universal. That it's a, it's a topological form. It's like a circle or a square. It belongs to 